Revelation chapter 1, let's go back to that. I, am a, I don't know when I'll get done with this because it just keeps expanding. When you go back to something you preached on years and years ago and you preach on it again, it just grows and grows because by then your understanding has matured and grown so much more. And I'm going to start at verse 4 just to bring us up to speed. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you in peace. And then he's going to show this grace and peace coming from the Trinity. From Him which is and which was and which is to come, that's God the Father. And from the seven spirits which are before His throne, which is the sevenfold Spirit of God. And from Jesus Christ. So there you have the Father, the Spirit, and the Son of God, the Word made flesh. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that washed, loved us and washed us from our own sins in his own blood. The sentence is not done yet. Now we, do, we move from the fact of being washed from our sins to the next thing that he's done for us in his love for us. And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So I want to talk today about the inestimable privilege and responsibility that adheres to us who are washed in the blood of Christ and are now made kings and priests unto God. Now, the first thing I just want to point out in passing, it said he has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. So this declares that God is the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one that brought about the birth, the conception of our Lord Jesus in the womb of the Virgin. And for this reason, he is called the Son of God, and thus God is his Father. And then he says, he's, he's made us kings and priests unto God. And notice that this is connected by the word and to the washing of the blood. So that being made kings and priests unto God follows and is an effect of the cleansing, redemptive blood of Christ. I give you a second verse that will lay that same thing out for us. And there's actually a third that God willing will get to later, but the second will serve as a sufficient to come in and confirm that as a result of the blood of Calvary's cross, we are made kings and priests unto God. And this particular passage is in Revelation 5, 9, and 10. And they sung a new song. Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, nation, and, there's that connective thought again, hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. So there you've got it again, where our being kings and priests is the effect of the redemptive blood of Christ. Now this making of us kings and priests fulfills an ancient promise that was made to our father Abraham. Now I know we don't trace our biological lineage to Abraham, but being people of faith and being given to Jesus Christ in the covenant of redemption to save, we are considered by God to be Abraham's seed. And I will give you the verse that says it. When Paul writes to Galatians in Galatians 3.29, writing to Gentiles, such as ourselves, and if ye be Christ's, that is, if you belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, that's a possessive case there, that apostrophe S establishes it thus, and if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. So that nails that right there. Now look at this promise that God made to Abraham regarding his seed and see it fulfilled in this declaration that we are made kings and priests unto God. Genesis chapter 17 where God announces his covenant with Abraham and he says in Genesis 17 and verse 6, and I will make thee exceedingly fruitful or exceeding fruitful and I will make nations of thee, and God did, and kings shall come out of thee. Now, God made literal, literal, physical nations out of Abraham. 
The Edomites can trace their lineage to Abraham. The Ishmaelites, the Arabs, can trace their lineage to Abraham. The Israelites can trace their lineage to Abraham. The Midianites can trace their lineage to Abraham, and they all had kings. So there's a, there's a, there's a physical, literal fulfillment of this in that kings came out of Abraham. But considering that we are also considered Abraham's seed and we are kings, you can see the fulfillment of this promise in us today kings made from Abraham. Now, uh, remember, and, and also this fact that he's made us kings and priests uh, fulfills what was spoken in the psalm that we read this morning. In fact, that is the reason I selected that psalm in the beginning of our worship, whereas we are called upon to praise the Lord, all in capitals, that's Jehovah. That name is to be honored, that name is to be blessed and praised. And uh, he made the statement there in verses 7 and 8, and this is true of every one of us that has been saved by the grace of God. He raiseth up the poor out of the dust and lifteth up the needy out of, our dung, out of the dunghill. What was our life apart from the salvation of Jesus Christ? It was a dunghill. That's what it was, just a dunghill. And he's raised us out of that dunghill that he may set him with princes, even with the princes of his people. And that word prince is a synonym for the word king. So he, by washing us from our sins, from our dung, if you will, by his blood, he has now raised us up and made us princes, kings and priests unto God among his people. A beautiful, isn't it? And then um, there's also a prophecy, this isn't in your notes, that this fulfills over in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 33, an ancient promise made through the prophet. Um, and we read that in verse 21 of Jeremiah 33. Uh, let, me, let me go back and, and get the preceding verse. And the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, if you can break my covenant with the day, and my covenant of the night, that there should not be day and night in their season, then may also my covenant be broken with David my servant, that he should not have a son to reign upon his throne, and with the Levites, the priests, my ministers. As the host of heaven cannot be numbered, neither the sand of the sea measured, so will I multiply the seed of David my servant. Of course, this is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. He is the greater David and referred to in prophecy, and we are considered his seed. And so he's multiplied this seed of David his servant and the Levites that minister unto me. So we are the seed of David his servant and also Levites, priests. In other words, kings and priests unto God, because David's seed is a royal dynasty. His seed constitutes the king. So there that prophecy is fulfilled, that we are kings and priests unto God. Now notice very carefully that, and I, I did well to read verse 4, that these words are spoken to the seven churches which are in Asia. And they represent all the churches of Jesus Christ of all time, ours included. So these words are describing us as a church. And our church is made up of kings and priests. I'm talking to them this morning. I'm addressing the royal family of God this morning. Did you hear what I just said? I am addressing the royal family of God this morning. And this church is made up of kings and priests, and that is why it is described in 1 Peter 2, 9, thusly. In 1 Peter 2, 9, it is described this way, speaking to people who are in the church, and we will come back to 2 Peter, and I'll show you he's talking about the church, the house of God. He says, but ye are a chosen generation. I want you to just notice that's mentioned first. The election, the choosings mentioned first. That's very critical as we develop this thought about being kings and priests unto God. So just tuck that away in your mind. First and foremost, we're chosen. We're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. Now, what do you think of when you think of royal? You think of kings, don't you? They're called royalty. The family of the king is called the royal family. And so being a royal priesthood, we are a kingly priesthood. We are kings and priests. Isn't that, that just brings that together so nicely. Now, now, being, now then this compares with another passage. This is interesting. In Revelation chapter 20, 
This being made kings and priests corresponds to those who in this passage are spoken of as having part in the first resurrection and are priests of God and of Christ and reign... That's what kings do. All you got to do is just look up the word reign or reigned in your Bible and you'll see when it talks about the tenure of a king, it'll say he reigned, he reigned, he reigned. It'll tell you how many years and so forth. But uh, this verse is going to describe those who have part in the first resurrection, are priests of God and of Christ, and reign. And if they reign, they're functioning as kings. Reign with him, with Christ, a thousand years. Now watch it. Revelation 26. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. The second death being the death of the lake of fire. If you are a partaker in the first resurrection, you will never go to hell. That's what that verse is teaching. The second death hath no power over you. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign. That's what kings do. So this is a king priesthood, a kingly priesthood, a royal priesthood. And shall reign with him a thousand years. Now, since those, watch it now, since those in the seven churches of Asia were already made kings and priests unto God, the language could not be more clear, then this indicates that they were partakers of the first resurrection and they were right then and there in the millennial thousand year reign of Christ. We are not waiting for that to come. It was going on at that time. Amen. That's as plain as plain can be. Now, what's this having part in the first resurrection? Well, I've explained this before, but I'll visit it again because it's been a long time since I've talked about it. The first resurrection, simply plainly, is the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. I will give you three passages that will nail that clearly. In 1 Corinthians 15, 20. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 20. First King, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the, watch it now, first fruits of them that slept. Doesn't that establish Christ as the first resurrection? If in his resurrection he's the first fruits. Then, first, uh, then Colossians 1 and verse 18. Colossians 1, 18. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. So there again, as far as being born from the dead, he's the first. And then the passage we studied the other day in Revelation 1.5. He is the first begotten from the dead. Paul said he was the, should be the first to rise from the dead. So the first resurrection is clearly the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now watch how we have a part in the first resurrection. It's just so clear. It's so plain Come over to Ephesians chapter 2. Seems like I preached on Ephesians one time <laughs> for five years. <laughs> and if, I don't think we'll ever forget that. Ephesians chapter 2, 4 through 5. Several of people in this church got converted and baptized under that series. It was, a, it was really a great study. Learned a lot. Ephesians 2, 4 and 5. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened. You know what the word quickened means? It means to make alive. That's what happens when a person is resurrected from the dead. He's quickened. He's made alive. Like the Bible says, Jesus was put to death in the flesh, but quickened, made alive by the Spirit. But now watch it. And even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us. But watch it. Together with Christ. By grace are you saved. Now, if we are quickened together with him who is the first from the dead, the first fruits, the firstborn, the first begotten, if we are quickened together with him who is the first resurrection, doesn't that give us part in the first resurrection? Doesn't it? Doesn't that follow? Isn't that plain? If we're quickened together with the first resurrection, we have part in the first resurrection. Is that not plain? Is that not plain? And thus, thus it is that we reign with Jesus Christ. The thousand year reign of Christ was already well underway when John addressed these seven churches of Asia. And so he's writing to these church members who have been chosen, who have been quickened together with Christ, part in the first resurrection, and washed in the blood, and made kings and priests unto God. 
every single child of God serving in this church, and I'll, te I'll tell you why I qualify that it, that way in a moment, every single one from the oldest, every member of this church from the oldest down to the very youngest is a king and priest unto God. You know what that means? Right now, Drew, you are the youngest member of this church. You are a king and a priest unto God as much as the oldest person out there is. I'd have to think a little bit to figure out who that is. Pardon me? Old Ed May, that's right. You're the old, actually, Ed, you are the oldest member of this church. So you are as much as a king and priest as good old Ed May. And you are old, Ed. I'm sorry. I hope I'm not upsetting you, but you are. And you are good, but you're old. I mean, you're pushing 90, brother. He's 89. And I hope I do as well as you do when I'm 89 years old. Have I got a witness to that? Man, I hope I do as well as Ed May. One thing Ed May knows how to do is take care of himself. Now, it's interesting. I look at this little boy sitting there with his boots and blue jeans, and he's a king and a priest, and I don't see a robe, and I don't see a crown on him yet. Oh, but he will have one. Shall I give you the verses that say it? We will be a crowned and robed priesthood before it's all over with. In 1 Timothy, or 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give to me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. So we're going to get a crown on our royal heads. And uh, then uh, that is affirmed again in Revelation 2.10. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and you shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Kings wearing crowns, we shall be. And then Revelation 7, 9, let's get the robe. You need the robe for the priest and the king. Revelation 7, 9. And after this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number of all nations, and kindreds, and people, and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. So we've got some great things ahead of us, don't we, as kings and priests? We'll wear crowns, and we'll wear robes, as kings and priests were wont to do in times past. Now. Let's first of all address this being kings. Let's talk about what's involved in our being kings right now. Right now. As kings, we reign in life right now with Christ Jesus. If you have a part in the first resurrection, you've been quickened from death unto life, or born again, or begotten again, or saved, the various words that are used to describe this experience of being a partaker in the first resurrection. It's interesting, Christ's resurrection is referred to as a birth, first born from the dead. It's referred to as a begetting, first begotten from the dead. And the experience of our passing from death unto life our being quickened is called a birth, except a man be born again. It's also called a begetting. We are, um, he hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So interesting how all these terms interchange to describe this one and self same experience of being brought from death to life. But in Romans 5, 17, let's look at us now as kings. Let's get that one first. And then we'll talk about priests. But let's deal with ourselves as kings first. Look at how we reign now. In Romans 5, 17, For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness, watch it now, shall reign in life by one Christ Jesus. So as kings right now, we are reigning in life by Christ Jesus. And then come over to Romans chapter 6. Or no, no, pardon me, Ephesians chapter 1. <clears throat> Let's go back there. <clears throat> we just want to show you how we're reigning with Christ Jesus. How being partakers in his first resurrection, we are kings reigning with him. In Ephesians chapter 1 um, and verse 20 and 21, he's describing the resurrection and exaltation or enthronement of our Lord Jesus. 
Get the language now, it's very important. Speaking of the mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him, now his enthronement, at his own right hand in the heavenly places, and notice how high a king he is raised to be, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, that includes all principality, power, might, and dominion that is seen and unseen, including the principality, power of Satan himself and his myriad fallen angels. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but in that which is to come. So here above every other power and authority and principality in this earth sits the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we reign with him. Look on to Ephesians chapter 2. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. Watch it now. Let's go back to the passage we just looked at. Start at verse 4 again, but move into verse 6 where it gets exciting. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. There we are, you see, raised from spiritual death by the same power that brought the body of the Son of God from the dead. There we are, partakers of the first resurrection. Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace are ye saved. Now watch. And hath raised us up together, just like he raised up Christ and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. And hath raised us up together. Watch it. And made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ. Christ Jesus, which means that in Christ Jesus, God has exalted us together with Him far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that's named not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, which means that the kings, the royal family that I address right now is positioned above the royal family of England and any other that may be in this earth. I, I just read the verses that make it expressly plain, expressly plain. You and I really don't fully comprehend the wonderful privilege that we hold as kings unto God. Now notice it says we are kings unto God, which means that our regal authority is to be exercised with an eye to the fulfillment, not of our will and our glory, but His will and His glory. And it is in eyeing His will and His glory as that to which we aim, we will find the fulfillment of ourselves. We will discover our best selves as kings and priests unto God. Now, as kings, we have authority and power and can therefore overcome the following things that if you stop and think about it, the fallen men of this world, their royal families included, are so subject to. We, as kings, are given power over. Power over what controls and drives them. First of all, as kings and priests, or as kings, we have authority over sin. In Romans 5.21, if you'll go there, Romans 5.21, that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign, there's that royal term, through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Now notice, as grace reigns in our lives, and as we reign through grace, and only through grace, notice verse 11, Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God. There you are, part in the first resurrection, reigning with Christ in life. There you are. But alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lusts thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of righteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive, that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace that reigns through righteousness. So as kings, we have power and we have authority over that which drives the masses of fallen men, and that is sin. We can, by the grace of God, and often do, as we should, say no to sin and trample it underfoot. 
Every time you say no to the lusts of sin, every time you take these members and you bring them into subjection to God, you are reigning over sin. Do you get that? Do you get that? So important to understand that. When you deal with sin in your life, do not view yourself as a victim of your lusts and, well, oh, I just can't help this. If you're a king unto God, you can. Don't see yourself as a victim. See yourself as a victor with power from God to say it nay and put it underfoot. Not only that, but as a king, you have authority over yourself. And this is the greatest one to conquer. The greatest enemy for us to conquer is the enemy of self. And as kings, we can bring that into subjection. Like Paul said, I keep my body under, under, keep it down in all, with all of its lusts. He said unto them, if any man come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. That is Luke 9, 23. Thank you. Luke 9, 23. See, as kings, we are able to subjugate the self that is ever, ever trying to usurp the throne. In fact, if you get the victory over yourself, you gain a victory that's greater than the greatest victories of the greatest kings and the greatest generals in all history. I'll give you two verses. I've given them before. In Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 24, 20, 32. Proverbs 16, 32. He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty. Yes, and the mightiest king that ever reigned. And he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh a city. Imagine God is telling you that being a king unto God, you can achieve victories that a Napoleon Bonaparte never did. As an example, or a Julius Caesar never did. As an example. As an example. And then in Proverbs 25, 28, 25, 28, he that hath no rule over his own spirit, doesn't control himself, is like a city that is broken down and without walls. The first and foremost thing as a king unto God, you need to go forth and wage victorious war against, is the one you look at in the mirror every morning. And if you can bring that one under subjection to God, like I say, you've achieved a victory that most of the fallen men of this world have not and cannot achieve apart from the grace of God. You are also able to overcome the world. 1 John chapter 5, 1 John chapter 5, 4 and 5. There's a war going on out there and it is a war against the faith you hold. The faith you hold in Jesus Christ and God is the creator of heaven and earth and in this book and in the truth of this book. There is a war being waged to wrest this faith from you, from you young people. They're after you. But you can win this war because you are a king unto God. And so we read in 1 John 4, 4 and 5, whatsoever is born of God, whatsoever is part of the first resurrection, overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? Who's the victor? Who wins the battle? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. When against all the forces of the world gathered together to wrest your faith from you. You hold it steadfast to the end. I don't care if you're dying on a stake, being burned alive. You're winning. You are reigning. Because the one thing they wanted to defeat in you, they could not. They could not. This is why the Apostle Paul, toward the end of his life, could say in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 7, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. How do we know, Paul, you fought a good fight? Here it is. I've kept the faith. That's why the battle of life is called the good fight of faith. To hold this faith. And to hold it fast. And to never let it be pulled away from you. 
and then being kings and thus able to overcome the world, we are also able to overcome the prince of this world, which is the devil himself. The devil is a very, very powerful being, but you have more power than he does. You've been exalted with Jesus Christ above all principality, including him. That little boy there, right there, through Jesus Christ, is more powerful than the devil himself, the prince and God of this world that is yanking it around all over the place. That's how powerful he is. That he can mobilize the nations of this earth to do his bidding. And while I'm on that, let me say this. The banding together of all the nations of this earth in a common cause to fight COVID-19 is not something for Christians to get excited about. If there's anything that Bible believers should know is that Satan has an agenda that he has been pursuing for centuries to unite the nations of this earth in a single body politic against God and against his Christ. And to do that, they need a pretext. And COVID-19 could be a very good one should God permit. This is not anything for us to get excited about. I'll tell you what it is as kings unto God. It is something for us to intercede against. Did I make that plain? This is, I'm, I'm preaching Bible here. Just look at what your Bible says about Satan. So you see, God divides the nations. God is the divider of nations. Satan is trying to achieve on an international scale what can only truly be achieved in the body of Christ, and that's the unity of various nations in one. And so, and so, we can overcome this prince. Every time you say no to his temptation, you're trampling your adversary underfoot. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 14. This is how we reign as kings. 1 John 2, 14. I have written unto you, fathers, because you've known him that's from the beginning. I've written unto you, young men, because ye are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. <laughs> Look at this, James chapter 4 and verse 7. James 4, 7. Submit yourselves therefore unto God. See, we're kings unto God. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Not he might, he will. You have the power to throw the word of God at him in faith and he has to duck, turn, and run. Whenever he comes at you with his temptations and you quote the Bible verse to him and you say, get thee hence, like our Lord said to him in the temptation of the wilderness, he's got to turn and run. Oh, he'll come back and you'll do the same thing again. You'll send him running, Running, running every time. I've told you what I do. There was something that I learned from Conrad years ago that I often do. I found it very effective. When I'm sitting at my desk and the most god-awful, abominable, perverse, horrible thoughts will enter into my mind, I will sit there at my desk and I will look at my window in my office downstairs and I will say, Satan, and I'll imagine this is what's happening because it is exactly what happens. Satan, get thee hence from my person, from my presence, from my proximity, and my property. That house belongs to me, not to him. Amen. And out he goes. Out he goes and I get on with my business. Because I understand I have that kind of power. We are kings unto God over Satan himself, the prince of this world. And while it is true, we do, watch it, listen, this is so critical. While it is true that we do not control everything that goes on in the world, as kings unto God, we do not let the world control what goes on in us. Shall I say that again? While we do not control everything that goes on in the world, as kings unto God, we do not let the world control what goes on in us. That's so important. Because that's where the Satan's trying to do, that's what Satan's trying to do. He's trying to get inside of you and get in your head. 
and control you through fear and intimidation and doubt and you name it. So the battle is to keep him out. And when you do that, you're wielding, you're wielding your regal authority. You don't beg the devil, would you please leave me alone? Oh, no, dear God, no. You say, get thee hence as a king. Where the word of the king is, there's power. Get thee hence. Brother Ben. What? It is a command with the authority of God. It is not a prayer. That's exactly, it's a command. Get thee hence. It's exactly what it is. You're not praying to the devil. You're commanding the devil. Now, you want to see what kind of kings we are? We're kings that even death itself cannot conquer. Look at what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15. Death itself cannot conquer us. 1 Corinthians 15, 55. Even though we die and we're buried, even in the face of that, the victory is still ours because we die in the hope of the resurrection and our souls and spirits fly to God in paradise and ourselves and our beings preserved, our identities preserved there while we wait with them on the other side for the great day of the redemption of our body. In 1 Corinthians 15, 55, O death, where is thy sting? This is a victory cry. O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. See that? And, and then... Then you might want to flip over to uh, Romans chapter 8 to show us victorious even in death. <clears throat> in Romans chapter 8, 35 through 37. You see, obviously, we must have the upper hand over death. Or how do you explain an apostle Paul when speaking of death, saying, It is better to depart and be with Christ than to remain. Far better. Even desiring that moment. And the more I live in this world, and the older I get, the more desirable that moment comes to me. Amen. I now understand what my mother used to in her dementia would say to me, and eventually she got to where she couldn't even remember to say this. But week after week after week, when I would take her home, when I would take her out of the car, to take her into the home where she lived. She would say, and she, the interesting thing about Alzheimer's is they will say the same identical thing over and over with the same words, the same enunciation, same emphasis, everything. It will sound identical every time. Ben, she would say, I want you to pray for the Lord to take me. I'm tired. I'm ready to go. And she'd say that over and over. You know what? That isn't a defeatist. That's a victor. That's a victor in the face of death. And she would say, it doesn't worry me a bit. I'm not afraid one bit, she would say. And so Paul could say in Romans chapter 8, 35, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, in being killed, in nakedness, famine, peril, sword, persecution, distress, tribulation, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. When we can go through all that and our faith is held intact, if anything, purified and strengthened through the process, this is what it is to be a king unto God. And here's another interesting thing before we're done. Being kings unto God, listen to it, we are God's Israel by definition. Because you know what the word Israel means? Prince of God. And the word prince means a sovereign ruler, a monarch, a king. The words are used interchangeably in your Bible. If you are a king of God, you are a prince of God, which is Israel, by definition, proof, Genesis 32, 28. 
28, where the name was first mentioned, or, or where Jacob was first named this, after wrestling with the angel throughout the night. We read in Genesis 32, 28, And he said, Thy name shall be no more called Jacob, but Israel. Look in your center column, and it'll define that for you. Prince of God. But then the English text will explain why he's called Israel. For as a prince thou hast power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. Hosea chapter 12. Hosea chapter 12, verses 3 through 5. I know that, that, that's, that's staggering to think of having power with God, but we do. That's why we get answers to our prayers. In Hebrews chapter, pardon me, Hosea chapter 12, 3 through 5, talking about Jacob, he took his brother by the heel in the womb, and by his strength he had power with God. And remember, as he wrestled with the angel, it said, Yea, he had power over the angel and prevailed. And the angel said, Let me go. And he said, I will not till thou bless me. Brethren, you and I can go to God and beg God and just keep begging and say, Lord, I'm not going to let you go till you bless me. And there's something about that grip and that prayer that holds him there, giving you power with him thus making you the Israel of God. He took his brother by the heel in the womb, and by his strength he had power with God. Yea, he had power over the angel and prevailed. He wept and made supplication unto him. He found him in Bethel, and there he spake with us. As the Israel of God, we have power with God and with men. So there we are, reigning in life as kings. I, I, I don't know if I'll, um, I'll explain this quite correctly, but, and I want to say this rightly, about this having power over God as the Israel of God. You know, our children, even our children that are under our authority and under our control, do not realize because of the great, great love we have for them, how much power they have over us. When I see my children broken and my children humbled from the mistakes and sins of life for which they suffer discipline, everything in me moves. The bowels of my compassion stir powerfully to do whatever I can do to help and relieve their distress. And so it is with our God. We are God's Israel. We have power with God and with men, as I shall show presently. But now let's switch over and look at the priests for a little bit. Let's think of ourselves as priests now, after having thought of ourselves as kings. Now, as priests, understand that when the New Testament is being written, the writers of the New Testament dip their pens into the language and institutions of the Old Testament to describe the institutions of the New Testament. In fact, the New Testament is contained in germ form in the Old Testament. The Law of Moses, with all of its types and shadows and prophecies, and then it's just like when you plant a seed in the ground and the outer shell in which this internal kernel of life is contained, that outward shell just rots away and then that internal kernel of life flowers out in this beautiful plant. And thus it was that the New Testament was encased, as it were, within the seed of the Old Testament institutions that rotted and decayed away as the New Testament institutions burst out in the flower that we have them today is one nice way to think of it. And of course, one of the major factors of the Old Testament institution of worship as it was ordained under Moses was the priesthood. And what they were, and where did those priests serve? <coughs> in the house of God. In fact, they were the only ones that were allowed in 
to the tabernacle and into the temple were the priests. No one else could go inside the sacred precinct. And so we as priests under the New Testament, fulfilling what that was a picture and foreshadowing of, because the law had a shadow of good things to come, we as priests serve in God's house. And just what is God's house after 42 years? You think you know what it is? Anybody want to say? The church, of course. 1 Timothy 3.15, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And he's talking about a local church there, just like this one, with officers, just like this one. All right, now, um, <clears throat> as priests, that's where we serve. I'll give you a verse now that says that once we've defined what the house is, which we just did with 1 Timothy 3.15. And I, what I want to show you today is you are doing today what Aaron and his sons and descendants, Abiathar and Zadok and so forth, Jehoiada, what these various guys did when they would go into the tabernacle or the temple, you're doing the same today. You were in the house of God offering sacrifices acceptable to God. 1 Peter 2.5, I told you we'd be back there. And remember what I told you, we read that we're a royal priesthood. We're kings and priests. But I told you the first thing it says is we're a chosen generation. So you want to hold that thought. I'm now going to tell you why I told you to hold that thought. You come to 1 Peter 2 and verse 5. Ye also as lively stones. Now in the Old Testament they had a temple that was made up of stones. Brought together and forming this magnificent building that was built under the reign of Solomon. Destroyed by the Babylonians and then rebuilt in the times of Ezra. And uh, beautified under Herod and was existing and standing in the days of our Lord until it was destroyed in 70 AD because it had been displaced by a house of God that is not made of physical stones of earth but made of human beings such as ourselves. We are the lively, living stones. Not out of dead, lifeless stones, but living stones. Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house. And, and it, this is a spiritual house held together by the Spirit of God. We're all united together in one body by the Spirit of God. We're built an habitation of God through the Spirit. A spiritual house and holy priesthood. This is what we all are in here that are in this church. A holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices. So we come into this house, we offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. And why are they called spiritual sacrifices? Because the services we offer to God as members of this church are prompted by the Holy Spirit and are sanctified by the Holy Spirit. If you were to take the Holy Spirit out of the service we render today, it would be nothing more than just physical ritual that would have no significance and no uh, would mean nothing before God. It would be no more than the, than the rituals that are gone through in a local Masonic law or some something like that, or some fraternity in a university. It would have no significance before God whatsoever. What makes what we do in here acceptable is the Holy Spirit prompting, motivating, moving, and sanctifying the service we render, therefore making it spiritual. Have I made that plain? So we are a holy priesthood in this house to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Now, the priesthood, remember what I just told you, that the New Testament writers take their pen and dip it in the institutions of the Old Testament to describe what's going on here. So there is a comparison that we can make between our priesthood and the priests in the Old Testament. Remember the law had the shadow of good things to come. We're enjoying the good things to come that the law had a shadow of. And by the way, the things we have are better than the things they have. If you ever go back and you read about the days of the Old Testament and kind of wish you could have lived then, don't wish that. This is vastly better than that. This is a better covenant and a better service and better prompt the whole thing. Better, better, better. That's the whole message of, message of the book of Hebrews. That what we have now was better than what they had then. But there is a comparison to be made. First, first... <laughs> In order to qualify to be a priest in the Old Testament, not just anybody could be a priest.
You didn't just up and say, well, I'd like to be a priest, so I'll go to priest school. I'm going to volunteer. To... No, that's not how it was done. You had to be born in the family of Aaron who was chosen of God to be the priest. In other words, the only way you could be a priest under the Old Testament is you had to be born in the chosen family. And Aaron did not choose that for himself. God chose him for that. And that was made very clear in Numbers chapter 16, where people from the other tribes and the Levites wanted to be priests. They wanted to volunteer for the service. They didn't think it was fair that only the house of Aaron got to do it, and they didn't get to have a slice of the pie. And of course, if you go read Numbers 16, you read that God got very upset about that, and they were judged very severely, even the earth opening up and swallowing them alive, because they wanted that for which they were not chosen. You see, the people in number 16 had a problem with the doctrine of election. That's the essence of it. So in order to be a priest under the Old Testament, you had to be born into the chosen family. Now for us to qualify to be priests under the New Testament, we've got to be born in the chosen family. See there? That's why I told you. First thing he says is chosen generation. Then he says royal priesthood. <laughs> I love that. There's that doctrine of election we all love. There it is. But now, even though you were, cho you were born in the chosen family, you did not officially function in the priesthood until you underwent an inauguration, a ritual of consecration. It's kind of like when the American people in an election choose a president. He doesn't become president until he is formally inaugurated on January 20th, I believe it is. Those who know your constant history, I think it's January 20th. He has to officially be inaugurated, and that's when he begins his term as president. And even if Donald Trump is re-elected, uh, he'll have to undergo that again to enter into his second term. He must be formally inaugurated. Well, the same thing was true under the Old Testament. If you go over to Leviticus chapter 8, and no, I'm not going to read it all, but I'm going to tell you what you will read for yourselves if you bother to do so. And that is that in order to function in the pre Priesthood, those of Aaron's family had to undergo a ritual consecration. And it consisted of this. They first of all were brought to the door of the tabernacle and underwent a complete washing. Then they received an investiture. Their priestly garments were put on them. An investiture. Then, then, after that, they received an anointing. The holy oil was, anointed, they, uh, was sprinkled on them. And then, after that, there was a ram of consecration that was offered, and some of the blood of the ram was taken and applied to the right ear on the lobe, on the right thumb, and on the right big toe. So they underwent an application of blood. Let's say it again. The rite of consecration so that they could now formally, officially function as priests in the house of God required a washing, an investiture, an anointing, and an application of blood. Now let's bring it over <laughs> into the New Testament. For us who are born in the chosen family to officially function as priests in this earth, we have to undergo a ritual qualification. The first thing, we need to undergo a washing. Anybody know what that washing is? Baptism. Baptism. Acts 22 and verse 16. Acts 22 and verse 16. And why tarriest thou arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins calling on the name of the Lord? Hebrew, I, and I'm only going there to show that baptism is a washing. Baptism does for us figurative what Christ's blood does for us literally. But that's another subject. You're just going to have to trust me on that one. I can't cover in detail every single subject I reference in every single sermon, even though it might raise questions, because if I do that, I would never get done. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22. 
He's writing to those who function as priests in the house of God. He said, let us, therefore, let us therefore, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So there, there's the washing of baptism. But then, when we're baptized, we receive an investiture. Did you know that? Come over to Galatians chapter 3, and I'll show you what the investiture is, what the garments are that we put on when we get baptized. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 27. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. That's our investiture. That's our garment, Christ. We put on Christ. We follow His example. We adopt His example, His attitude. We walk as He walked. We put on Christ, and we do that every day of our life as we function as priests in the house of God. Romans chapter 13, 13 and 14. This is what I hope you put on you before you came here this morning. Not just to close over your body. I hope you'd put on Jesus Christ this morning when you came here. Those are your priestly garments. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envy, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. And you could take that subject of how we put on Christ and explore it in detail. But again, we must pass on. Then there's also an anointing. There's also an anointing we receive when we undergo the rite of consecration. And it is mentioned in Acts 2.38. Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And in the Bible the Holy Ghost is described as an anointing. An anointing. And then lastly, you receive an application of the blood as you pursue your service in priesthood. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7. 1 John 1, 7. But if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. So there you've got it. We've got the washing, we've got the investiture, we have got the anointing, and we've got the application of blood. And with that, we are now formally consecrated and inaugurated to function as royal priests in the house of God, which is exactly what you are doing today. We open our hymnals and sing. We are offering the sacrifice of praise to God as His priests. We offer our prayers. This is a service we perform as priests before Almighty God. We present our bodies a living sacrifice as priests before God in His house. We function as kings and priests, consecrated priests. Now, in this function, and I'm not going to finish today, so we'll just have to leave some for next Sunday. I, I, I hope I've given you something to think about. I hope that you feel very privileged this morning. You should. But also great responsibility adheres to us in this function. Now notice he's made us kings and priests unto God, and we function as kings and priests unto God at one and the same time. As priests in this house, we intercede with God for others. As kings, we prevail in the intercession. Because as kings, we have power with God and with men. As priests, we enter just as the priest would go into the house on behalf of the people, worshiping people standing outside. The priest would go in as a mediator, interceding on their behalf. So do we as priests of God go to God on behalf of others, and we prevail in our intercessions. Notice if we go back to 1 Timothy. It was in 1 Timothy chapter 3, 14 and 15 that we were told how, what Paul was writing about. He said in 1 Timothy 3, 14 and 15, these things, and this is going to include everything he has written up to this point. So I'm going to, I'm going to go to this first and then we'll back up. Just showing you that what I'm about to read to you was written for this purpose. Got it? These things. 
write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if a tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So the things he's been writing up to this point all deal with how we're supposed to conduct ourselves in this church. For example, in chapter 2 he gives the instruction about women. They're not to teach or to usurp authority in the church. That, that would be one example of how to behave ourselves in the house of God. But anyway, and that's why we don't have women preachers. That's why we don't have a Joyce Myers walking back and forth up here barking, claiming she's got a gift to preach because God spoke to her heart and told her. I'll tell you who spoke to her, her heart, told her to preach. It was the devil. <laughs> First Timothy chapter 1, 2, pardon me, in verse 1. Now remember, this is being written for us to know what to do in church, how to behave in church. This is part of our priestly function, don't you see? Our royal priestly function. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. So you see the various forms of prayer, supplications, prayers, intercessions, giving of thanks. These are all priestly functions, part of our service in the house of God. And brethren, brethren, just stop and ask yourself this question. Where would this world be? Where would the church of Jesus Christ be were it not for the prevailing prayers of the saints throughout the centuries? You say, well, the world is a terrible place, and I'll agree with that, and getting worse by the day. But what would it have been had there not been the prevailing prayers of the saints? It would be so much worse. You think of the peace, regardless of what riots are going on in other places. If you think of the peace you enjoy, in the neighborhood in which you live right now, you know why you're able right now to lead that quiet and peaceable life with all this stuff going on around us? It's because of this that he just said to make prayers to that end. You see? You see? What would this world be and what would the church be were it not for the prayers, the prevailing prayers, the priestly, kingly prayers of saints throughout the centuries? And then when you come to Revelation chapter 8, Revelation chapter 8, as we are brought to the final hours of earth's history and as these trumpets sound and frightful judgments, woes are unleashed, unleashed upon the face of this earth, do you know why those will come about? In Revelation chapter 8, 3, And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given him much incense, and that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. The prayers made in this church go up before God's throne. And the smoke of the incense, which came with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And in connection with that event, the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and earthquakes. And seven angels, which had seven trumpets, prepared themselves to sound. The very judgments of God that will be poured out on this earth in the end times will be an answer to the prayers of the saints who have begged God to be avenged of their enemies. Does this not show the kingly power of the priestly prayers of the saints? Does it not show that? The very judgments that will be visited upon the wicked of this earth in the end will be an answer to the intercessions of God's saints against that wickedness. You're kings and priests. You're sitting pretty high this morning. And I will close with this one point that I will elaborate more on God willing next Sunday, but I just want to 
grab it and throw it out there and then we come back to it God willing next week in Matthew chapter 6 31 to 33 the service we render here as kings and priests should take priority in our thoughts and actions over and above our economic concerns far and away in Matthew 6, 31 through 33, Therefore take no thought, saying, What we shall, shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God, where we function as kings and priests, and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Amen.